Alright, so what's up you guys, it's your boy Don Show, and for today's video, I'm covering some of the more important gameplay related tips that will help you out and grow as a multi-blood type Lumina player. Now before we dig into today's video, I just wanted to say that if you do enjoy multi-blood or fighting game content in general, that you might want to consider hitting that sub button, as I do plan on making many more helpful guides for all the beginners out there, and furthermore try to keep you guys updated with everything as fast as possible surrounding this game and more. Now with all the typical YouTuber talk out the way, let's get into the video. The first point of today's video I'd like to give out to Rapid Beats. And for those who might not know what Rapid Beats are, basically they're auto combos but named differently in multi blood type Lumina lingo. The reason I'm talking about Rapid Beats is because a lot of new players or players who might have had some previous experience in fighting games, they have this idea that auto combos in fighting games are bad or scrubby and something you generally don't want to use. However, it's a different ball game when it comes to type Lumina, as Rapid Beats in Lumina are actually relatively important. Now let's take a look at the average freehand combos in type Lumina. If we take a casual mid-screen route then this will most likely fall somewhere around the 3k mark. These type of combos are something that come into play when a player gets more comfortable with their character. They've memorized their character's moveset and so on, pretty much the first layers of learning the basics behind a character. However as a beginner, learning these combos and memorizing them can be quite a hurdle. Furthermore, landing these combos in real time in ranked matches or something similar might not be as easy since there's pressure involved, and this results into combo drops or panic mashes which will lead into rapid beats regardless. And that is perfectly fine. Whilst rapid beats are something you won't rely on in the future as heavy as you might do now, there is nothing wrong with using them to make sure they hit you just land at discounting, and the whole idea behind it being scrubby to use auto combos can actually go out the window as a good player will make sure to convert the hits that they manage to get in by any means, even if that means using a simple rapid beat. Whilst Rapid Beats are not the most damaging routes, it's not as bad of a position to be in when it comes to type Lumina. As a situation that presents itself after a Rapid Beat combo, that is what's truly valuable, generally speaking even more so than the combo itself. And this makes it so that we come back to the point that using Rapid Beats is perfectly fine and we add in the important piece of knowledge that the situation that comes afterwards, which is referred to as Okizemi or Oki okay in short, will be the important part and whether you use freehand combos or Rapid Beats, the ender should be the the same. Rapid Beats themselves exist out of a total of 3 stages. We have the first part of the Rapid Beat sequence, which will be the first 2 hits that start up the Rapid Beat itself. Then we have the second part, which is the launcher and directly the third hit of a Rapid Beat combo. And when successful, it will put us up in the air and allow us to continue from there. Then we have the third stage of the Rapid Beat, which will be the ender otherwise known as the grab into the knockdown. The grab at the end is very important, as the knockdown is something that becomes more and more valuable as you progress into the game, if you find a proper knockdown situation aka Oki situation that is in your favor, the end result will often be that you're able to keep your opponent in the same place by having them block something as soon as they wake up, or you can set up a nice mix up and gamble on getting your hit in that way. Since you can keep these type of advantages and create these type of situations even after using your rapid beats because of the knockdown grab that you get at the end of it, you should not worry about whether or not using rapid beats is scrubby, as the most important part comes afterwards. That is where you truly make it count. As a beginner, your knockdown game might not be as strong, as you might not know the setups for your character that make the most out of these type of situations. But even that is fine in the beginning. The more important part here is that you realize why it's valuable. And after understanding that, you can always go out your way to look for easy setups for your main character to start expanding your gameplay and pressure in game. On that note, do keep in mind that grounded rapid beats get skilled pretty badly when it comes to damage. So try slowly working on replacing your rapid beats by more fleshed out combos as time goes on to get more value out of your hits and make your gameplay more lethal all round. Then for the second point of the video, I want to talk about anti-airing. Anti-airing in Melty Blood is quite different as you might know it, as you don't particularly have an anti-air dedicated button like a 6P from Guilty Gear or have something like a go-to down heavy like you might have somewhere else. With Melty Blood being quite an aerial game, you will find that meeting opponents in the air is quite common, and that will result into a situation situation where you rather want to air to air with your opponent instead of being grounded and picking your opponent up from there. The one mechanic that really plays into this is called Fatal Counter. Fatal Counters are stronger counter hits that cannot be checked out of until the character hits the ground. They also have an increased damage on the combos that you do after getting a Fatal Counter as well. The most common way to get a Fatal Counter is to hit someone out of the air when they are pressing something, and if you do this successfully, you are in for a treat, as air Fatal Counters are yet again completely untested 
unattackable until the character hits the floor, allowing for easy combo pickups and an opportunity to do big damage. Keep in mind that you should try to hit people out of the air with your fastest button as a fatal counter will give you enough time to confirm the situation on what's going on and allow you to get a combo on time as long as your opponent doesn't reach the ground. So all in all, it's better to swing fast buttons in the air rather than heavy ones, as chances are that you will get fatal countered yourself if you hang around in the air swinging your long lasting buttons. And by using your faster buttons instead, the chances of getting picked up out of the air decreases by quite a bit. So the next time you find yourself wanting to anti air someone or get them out of the air altogether, keep in mind the speed of your buttons and use them accordingly to avoid getting fatal countered yourself. And instead try to get them yourself and make sure those fatal counters hurt when you get them at your advantage. For my next point, I'd like to talk about resource management as this is something that you can go pretty deep into as resource management is really important when we consider higher levels of play. However, we are not here to think about that level of play yet, so the need to go that deep into it is not really there. But what we can do instead is talk about the importance of starting to recognize your resources that you have available to you and getting used to actually using them. Especially for type Lumina, this is something that is quite important and can completely make the difference in all your matches. Mechanics like Moon Skills and Moon Drive are very strong tools in this game and when utilized even semi-decently, it can become a big advantage over your opponent who might not use his resources with any thought or even use them at all. I say this because it's not uncommon for beginner multi -butt players to sleep on their moon gouge or resources altogether and therefore things like moon skills or moon drives go pretty much untouched. And that is something you really want to avoid as moon gouge is in my opinion the most valuable resource you can have in this game. Moon gouge really allows you to turn the tables when you need it the most when used correctly. So I highly advise to replay the tutorials when it comes down to everything related to moon gouge and realize what it can be used for on a basic level and from there on out try to slowly implement these tools into your game. Make sure to look at your own character, check what their moon skills are and think about situations that you might be able to use them in. Briefly mentioning the value of things like moon skills in this video wouldn't justify the value of it at all. So that is something I will explain deeper in my upcoming video as it's a crucial part of the game and I'd like to take time to explain this properly instead. For now, realizing you have it available to yourself and slowly trying to implement it into your game would already be more than enough to level up your game by quite a bit. And as we talk about resources, I do want to give a quick mention of Vital Source. This too is something underused by newer players and for those who don't know, Vital Source is a portion of your life bar that can be gained back through a forced release aka entering a heat state. And being aware of the ability to heal back health is something important as the health you can get back sometimes is no joke, making it quite a comeback mechanic when used correctly. So start thinking about your resources and try to utilize them in your future games. This is already way better than letting them sit through the rounds and you will find yourself last a lot longer through your fights. And if things go well for you, you will start winning more as well. And I know I said I didn't want to go too deep into the moon system, however I'd like to take a closer look at moon drives specifically as my next point. Moon drives are very important and also very useful when you use this mechanic correctly. And by having played the tutorial in game about this mechanic, I don't feel like the true value behind this option is really getting through. So I'd like to explain it a bit more thoroughly to you guys in this video. Now moon drive can be activated by pressing BC in a neutral state when your moon gouge is at 50% or more. This turns your moon gouge red and it will turn into a slowly draining timer that cannot be refilled until the moon drive ends. The more moon gouge you have when activating moon drive, the longer it will last. But here comes the important part. As once you activate moon drive, you will notice that it will cause the game to slightly freeze or maybe even pause. And because of this effect, many people refer to it as a pause button. Now with this brief moment, you can give yourself all the time that you need to react to whatever is happening on screen. And from there on out, you can decide on the best course of action. Maybe your opponent was about to hit an overhead and you weren't quite ready yet to block that, but with this brief moment, you can recognize it and then block accordingly. Perhaps it can even be a bit cheeky as once you pop your moon drive, you might recognize that your opponent is doing something risky and you can punish them from there on out. But let's take a closer look at the activation part. The activation of moon drive has 3 frames worth of invulnerable startup and 2 frames of invulnerable recovery. And universally speaking, characters get a handful of buffs when you're in moon drive state as well. For example, your moon skills will have a reduced cost. After using your moon drive with a full gouge, it takes 6 moon skills to use the whole meter. And after activating moon drive with 50%, it will take 3 moon skills instead. And since we're talking about moon skills, let's talk about the effect moon drive has on them. As 
once you're in moon drive, your moon skills will get the ability to clash one frame right after, so it's something really fast and really strong. They will also have a significantly better magic circuit gain, regardless if your moon skills actually hit or get blocked. Generally speaking, when you're in moon drive, you gain magic circuit passively either way. This gets pretty noticeable once you pop your moon drive at 100%, as you gain about 1.5 bars over the full duration. And if you activate your moon drive at 50%, you gain about half a bar instead. And we aren't done with the buffs yet, as you get quite a bit more freedom when it comes to movement. For example, you will be able to triple jump and you get an additional air dash. But there's one rule to it, as you cannot use your additional air dash to air dash back or forward twice. But if you want to air dash forward once and air dash back afterwards to perhaps bait your opponent in pressing something, then you can definitely do so. It's safe to say that Moon Drive can do a lot for you defensively, but it also has some offense utility as well, as you can use the pause it has on activation to cancel special moves even when they whiff, which means that it can also be used as a combo extension tool and a way to make your risky choice more safe. And after hearing all these benefits, it should be quite clear that using your Moon Drives is something that you should definitely try to do in your matches. Then for my last tip of today's video, it's a really simple one and that is to avoid mashing follow-ups on every shield clash that you interact with. It's extremely common for beginners to use or perhaps even overuse the shield mechanic as it's a cool way to negate damage. However, when beginners do this, they also feel the need to immediately follow up from it with one of the follow-ups the game has to offer. And let me tell you that sometimes you're really just better off shielding and doing nothing afterwards instead. There's a relatively good chance that your opponent will find themselves panicking after realizing that they got shielded, which results in them trying to shield back immediately in order to kinda last minute save themselves from the potential threat of receiving damage. And would you actually interact on the panic shield, you entertain the guessing game that comes along with shielding. And that means the outcome of you shielding something correctly but still getting hit for trying to get a follow up in is definitely out there. By keeping yourself calm after successfully shielding an incoming attack and not committing to a follow up every time, you can turn tables on your opponent who is more than willing to shield back right away. And as a result, you will be able to punish quite a few people who just aren't willing to take the hit after being shielded. Of course, this doesn't mean that you should never use a follow up, but I'd rather want you to understand that sometimes just shielding and watching your opponent panic is more than enough and the punish you can get in afterwards will make it more than worth to keep your calm at times. And on that note we've come at the end of today's video. These were some important things that I wanted to share with the newer players as starting a new fighting game and having to figure it all out on your own with no clue where to start can get pretty hectic. So hopefully you guys will find the information I gave today helpful and made you able to move forward. Now if you guys do feel like you want more beginner content like this in general then I'll gladly make other videos like today's guide for beginners so let me know in the comments down below if that is of any interest and at last if you guys want more help from me directly or just feel like joining a place where you can meet more melty but players to talk about the game and have fun with then i do recommend joining my discord which i'll provide the link for down below in the pinned comment so that was it for today you guys it was your boy Doncho. stay healthy stay blessed and i'm out peace